Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. To have a species be extinct and have a, a second chance to revive it is unheard of. All right, Keegan, let's make history all over again. Come on, here we go. If you flash forward 50 years, they look exactly the same way they did in the pictures back then. Dove hunting is better than deer hunting because we go deer hunting in like November and stuff, and I can't say anything. It's like real quiet. But like in dove hunting, we can talk and eat and everything. It's cool. When I'm out in the field and a shot presents itself, I get really excited because all the elements are there to make the perfect shot. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks, Guts, Glory, Ram. To have a species be extinct and have a, a second chance to revive it is unheard of. We're going to basically see what we can find in the way of ivory bill signs or even the birds themselves. These birding biologists are looking for a ghost. The ivory billed woodpecker, a bird thought to have been extinct. Or is it? In early 2004, along the Cache River in Arkansas, this video was taken from the seat of a canoe. Oh, see it? It's flying away now. John Arvin is one of many bird experts who has analyzed the footage. When you can see the underwing, you see a large amount of white on the trailing edge separated by a black line of feathers down the center. These flight patterns appear to show that the bird is in fact an ivory bill woodpecker as opposed to a pileated woodpecker. This video Multiple sightings and analyzed audio recordings were enough evidence by experts to declare that the ivory bill lives. It was an incredible frenzy. The whole ornithological community was just electrified by this. The bird had been thought extinct for 60 years. The Arkansas footage brought a lot of hope and it made other states like Texas get very excited because the chances of that bird being anywhere in its range are high. We're just starting here. So John Arvin is leading a team of biologists, including John Fredland and Corinne Campbell. Navigate back. Their goal to find the ivory-billed woodpecker here in Texas. Yeah. <laughs> the search area covers part of the bird's historic range. Thousands of acres of bottomland hardwood forest habitat found in the Big Thicket National Preserve of Southeast Texas. Red bellied again. We're looking for any kind of woodpecker sign, either scaling, actually chipping away at the bark, looking for grubs for food, or cavities that it would make a home for the night. Yeah, but something really jacked that snag up. It's torn apart. We found some scaling that looks like woodpecker work. It's promising. It looks pretty pitted, but it is scaled all up and down. Take some footage of it. <laughs> By the end of the day, the team sees plenty of woodpeckers, but no ivory bill.
Intense logging of bottomland hardwood forests in the late 1800s wiped out most of the ivory bill's habitat. The decline started when a lot of these large forests with large trees were cut down. The only film ever taken of an ivory bill was captured in 1935 in northeast Louisiana. The footage gives us some movement, some life to this bird, and most importantly, some voice. Massive sound equipment captured the only calls of the bird ever recorded. For the 30s, it was cutting edge. For these guys to have that kind of equipment back then was remarkable. In the search area, there are a total of eight species of woodpeckers, including the northern flicker, the red-bellied, and the red-headed. But the closest look-alike is the pileated. Extremely similar, this makes finding the ivory-billed woodpecker a bit of a challenge. Look at the back, and there's a white backpack on the ivory-billed, yet it's black on the pileated. And both birds are crow sized, so when you see a crow sized woodpecker with a white backpack, you should get excited. But most people are seeing the one with the black backpack, and that's the pileated. It's now the middle of the search season. There it is. I see it there. The team hopes some new technology will help spot an ivory bill. A cavity was found the last time we visited this area. We're putting a video camera up to see if we can see anything that looks like an ivory build. Pull the slack out. This isn't just any camera. It has time-lapse capabilities and is motion sensitive. Any bird is most active at sunrise and sunset. Green light. And it's hopefully going to capture a bird coming in to roost for the night. What do you think? Looks pretty good to me. All right. At another location, this black gum right here will probably work for us. John is setting up an autonomous recording unit, which is programmed to record at sunrise and sunset. Round go. I've been anticipating its arrival for quite some time. There. We have a longtime local resident who has reported activity, and we're going to deploy it and see if we can't pick up some sound. Let's ease his way through this mess. The team still has thousands of acres to search. They hope this new equipment will help improve their chances. We're covering the ground really well. We're getting into some areas that no one's ever been to probably before, yet we haven't seen evidence that would support Ivory Bill being here. There is one species of woodpecker that is not extinct, but it is endangered, the red cockaded woodpecker. Unlike the ivory bill, the red cockaded woodpecker had enough numbers at the time that it was put on the endangered species list and that we had something to work with, something to improve in pond, something to increase. Biologists here have a huge nursery of sorts as they try to raise more. Coming up on the nest tree here, to check on the active tree cavities during the breeding season, the biologists use what's called a peeper cam. Okay. Might take a second. Kind of a tough one to get in there. There we go. I've got one male with a red crown patch, and then we have a female here that has no crown patch on her, which is good. It's 324, three chicks, 50 footer. Once new chicks hatch, the biologists climb up to those 40 to 50 foot high cavities. How's it going up there? You got them yet? To ban the birds, to give each new chick a name and a number. We try to do all the banding and the climbing within 15 to 30 minutes because we really don't want to interrupt the feeding schedule of these nestlings. There you go, Nancy. Thanks. You go. Okay. Let's see what we got here. 
Okay, they look about nine days old. Got their eyes slightly open. You can see the feathers are starting to come out. It's gonna be the um, dark blue of her mauve. We color band the birds in case we have a single male that uh, has his own territory, but he doesn't have a mate. And that way we can uh, track down the female and move her to that single male and hopefully they will nest the following year. This is a good spot. For the search team, one way to try and capture a glimpse of the ivory bill is to sit and play some music, <laughs> bird music. Turn the volume, double knocks. We use playback to call ivory bills in. Um, the idea being the bird will hear its own species call and want to come and check it out. And while out alone with their cameras, they've seen their share of birds. I saw a pileated during the playback, but he didn't seem to care at all about it. He just went away working on that snag over there. Snakes are out again. Can't stay out like that. Lots of activity once it warms up in the swamp. immense forest, species two below, a team of biologists, and one bird. The odds are stacked. Some cavities on that tree. But there is always hope. Waypoint name, CCC. After almost six months, the team tracked tens of thousands of acres. As for the sound recordings from the ARU, nothing. And the pictures from the remote camera. There's me around the tree. <laughs> it looks like you're posing for it. <laughs> I am. It did capture some critters. There's a deer. I see a shadow. Is yeah. that what that is? That's the deer, yeah. Okay. But again, no ivory bill. No, you can't tell what it's doing. So after half a year in the big thicket, a ghost is still a ghost. There was nothing promising that we found out here to tell us that the bird is even in this state at all. But like any lost treasure, it might be hiding just out of sight. If there was a bird out there, I mean, there's still a huge chance it could be, and we didn't see it because it's, it's a pretty gigantic area we were covering, and it would have to rely on a whole lot of luck if it happened to be where we were. And all is not lost. This search brings new energy to the efforts to conserve and even restore these pristine bottomland hardwood forests of East Texas. All right, Cleveland, let's make history all over again. Come on, here we go. The Cleveland family is recreating a photo taken 50 years ago. <laughs> Joan Angen got a surprise of her life one morning when she logged on to a local news site. There was this picture of my brothers and I, and I was like, oh my gosh, what is this doing here? The picture was part of Texas Parks and Wildlife's 50th anniversary celebration. First of all, I was just totally shocked to see the picture. <laughs> then the memories came flooding back. My father was a traveling salesman for Merck, and Mom would bring all five of us kids up here, and we would stay up here by ourselves with Mom, and we just literally just lived out here for a month at a time. The memories for, for us as, as kids and being boys, you know, it was just an awesome summer being able to do whatever you wanted to do. You could get up every morning and go fishing. You could uh, fish all day long and get tired of fishing, you go swimming. You know, it was a great summer. You didn't want to go back home for any reason because you had everything up here that you loved doing. And it was one of those happy summer days that a Texas Parks and Wildlife photographer snapped the picture. I want y'all to try to recreate that photo at all costs. 50 years later, another Parks and Wildlife photographer asked if they would do it all again. Recreating the footsteps of another photographer from Parks and Wildlife was a, a big thrill for me, something I, I really wanted to do. One more, here we go, one, two, and smile, smile, smile. See, if you look at the photo from 50 years ago, all of them look so happy and like they just get along and they connect well with one another. And if you flash forward 50 years, they look exactly the same way they did in the pictures back then. 
the close-knit siblings still enjoy spending time together outdoors. I think the, the good relationship they have now is as a result of the years that they've spent visiting state parks. To help more families enjoy the outdoors, Texas State Parks offer outdoor family workshops. You're going to get two poles. Folks It'll who have never camped before get to experience the great outdoors without spending a lot of money. We provide all the gear, the tent, the stove, cook sets, utensils. We provide air mattresses for the adults so you don't have to wake up with creaky bones. The only thing they have to bring is their food and their sleeping bag or blankets, and we provide everything else. For the Cleveland kids, Inks Lake State Park holds a special place in their hearts. Their parents' ashes are sprinkled there. After coming up here, it's like, hey, we need to get back to doing this again some yeah. more. You know, yeah. we're all lives were so busy now, but just coming up here today is uh, it's been great, you know, bringing back the memories. This event, why it can be such a huge volcano and build up so much pressure, is because there is, there is about seven times as much mass. Ariel Haynes is pretty much like any other high school student. But in one respect, Ariel is a little different from the other kids her age. Oh, Ariel, Ariel, right above your head. Got him. All right. Ariel likes to hunt. That's four, Ariel. Yep. While other kids her age are busy shopping at the mall or watching TV, Ariel is enjoying the opening of dove season <laughs> yeah. alongside her father. He was low anyway. Too low. Got him. <laughs> dove hunting is better than deer hunting because we go deer hunting in like November and stuff and I can't say anything. It's like real quiet. But like in dove hunting we can talk and eat and everything. It's cool. We're going to move on out there because these guys are starting to show up. What's not cool is the difficulty many folks face in locating affordable hunting land. Since most of the land in Texas is privately owned, many sportsmen face a common dilemma, finding a place to hunt. George and Ariel Haynes have been hunting together since she was just 12 years old. I like spending time with my dad. He's cool. Most of the time. You know, actually, now you're, really, you're starting to shoot a little bit, and you're starting to handle that gun just right now, and you're getting on them. We spent a, a lot of good quality time together. You know, and with dove hunting, you can talk, you can walk around, you can share the time in the event, you know, just openly together. So it's really, really great. Actually, it's been good. It's been great, man. It couldn't get any better, I don't believe. I, George I and Ariel, it. along with yeah, a group of friends, that. have traveled 200 miles yeah. west from their home in Houston to Guadalupe County. Here, the dove are plentiful, and the price is right. Good shot, Ariel. Oh, I thought you hit it. I can't believe it. He's going he's gonna to pop up whenever over there. Whenever I think they there. hit him. I think they hit him over there. This 123-acre patch of sunflowers is ideal dove habitat. It's also private land. But thanks to Texas Parks and Wildlife and cooperating landowners, the property is part of more than 40,000 acres of privately owned land leased by the Department for Dove Hunting by the public. It's part of the Public Hunting Lands Program. It is a program where we've gone out and leased lands directly from landowners, and then we turn around and allow the public to access those through the annual public hunting permit. The permit allows hunters access to over one million acres of land, and not just for hunting dove. Deer, turkey, quail, feral hogs, squirrel, and waterfowl hunting are all available. The dove lease portion of the program started in 1994 with 10 leases along interstates 35 and 37. Today, it's expanded to over 100 leases all across the state. 
we sold quite a few calves here, a couple of loads a few weeks ago. But the prices is a little better than it had been, you know. Kurt and Julia Walkerhagen own 400 acres of farmland they affectionately call Poverty Hill. When they moved here in 1941, the farm included almost 5,000 acres and over 700 head of cattle. Today, Poverty Hill's 400 acres hold about 100 cows. <laughs> I used to farm cotton, milo, and corn, and everything, maybe three, 4,000 acres of that, and I always kept clean fields, no Johnson grass, no sunflowers, nothing. Now I got sunflowers. <laughs> I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> the Walker Hoggins lease all 400 acres to Parks and Wildlife for the public dove hunting program. It wasn't so much the money that interested them as it was the chance to help. I used to do a lot of hunting myself and everything, and it's just the program that I think is well worth for those people that don't have the opportunity to hunt anywhere. Hunters are asked to follow a few general rules when using lands leased for public hunting. The rules are posted at each site and are designed to ensure respect for the land and the landowners. Yeah, if we see any more out here, we'll just pick them up. Landowner gives you the privilege to come out and hunt and uh, taking care of the property, no trash, no debris. It's real important. So hopefully they'll continue to let us come out and hunt the property in the future. For George and Ariel Haynes, this hunting trip is more about spending time together than it is about the birds. And since Ariel is under 17, she can hunt for free, as long as she's with a permitted adult. That helps to make hunting more accessible and affordable for families like hers, which just happens to be the main goal of the Public Hunting Lands Program. We want to see people go out, have a place they can access inexpensively, and take the kids hunting. That's what it's really for. Winged him. Got him. All right. You got him? Mm-hmm. Good. Oh, yeah. She took the one on the right. I took the one on the left. And we both hit them. That's great. Beautiful looking birds. Nice, nice looking, looking birds. And now the birds are really starting to fly now. The action's starting to pick up, so it looks real good. My second, but <laughs> planning on getting more. <laughs> oh, Ariel, look up, look up. Parents have long yeah. used hunting to teach their children about sportsmanship and responsibility. With the success of the Public Hunting Lands Program, it's a tradition that is continuing for one more generation of Texans. <laughs> oh, he's still flying. Oh, this is good hunting out here today, Ariel. Yeah. I mean, they're still firing off. Thanks for bringing me that. Oh, man, that's a good time, honey. <laughs> uh, I had a good time. The shallow flats on the Texas coast spawn some of the best fishing in the nation. Seagrasses are a big part of the reason why. But running boats in the shallows can destroy these grasses. Propeller scars remain for years. So when you come to shallow water, stop your engine, lift your prop, drift with the wind, Pull or troll. Lift, drift, pull or troll. Protect the seagrass. My name is Chase Fountain, and I'm the photographer for Texas Parks and Wildlife. I've got the best job in the world because my office is the state of Texas. One thing about my job is that one week I could be in Big Bend doing a cattle drive shoot. The next week I could be in the swamps in a wildlife management area or the next week I could be photographing at a commission meeting or even the governor. So every week presents 
a new challenge and a new thing, a new excitement for me. Typically, when I'm on location, I you know I look for the proper lighting and composition that that frames the photograph nicely, that that can tell a story that goes beyond just taking a snapshot. Uh, anybody can take a picture. The hard part is to be able to bring the emotion of that shot to the people and for them to uh, experience what I was experiencing or take something from that photograph. When, when I'm out in the field and uh, a shot presents itself, I get really excited because I know the lighting's right, the composition's right, all the elements are there to make the perfect shot. And it's like, touchdown, you know, you got it, you know? And, uh, and sometimes you'll be out there for hours, if not days, and not get the shot that you're looking for, but it's that one exact moment, that perfect moment where you get the shot that you want. And that's what it's all about. This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.